Genesis 12, <clears throat> you pray for me. I told my wife this afternoon I hadn't coughed since this morning and then I started coughing. So I will go home and treat that. So I don't think it's anything more serious than that. I really don't. I can taste. That's a good sign. I can smell. <clears throat> I just didn't want to tell some of you. I figured some would catch that. So Genesis chapter 12. Good to be here this afternoon. Appreciate you coming. Um, I'm releasing now. Should be uploaded. Um, Watchman for this week is... The message I preached down at Ron's last uh, Sunday evening, and I can tell you preaching four sermons in one day, that was, that was quite a bit. Especially I knew when I got down there, and once I got started, it wouldn't be a 20 minute or 30 minute or 40 minute or 50 minute. It would be like an hour and 25 minutes, something like that. I could have, I could have made it go two hours. I could have added a lot more. I wanted to, uh, but I, I knew that I had the DVDs that had, you know, pretty much most of what I know about the Bible issue. And I made sure that everybody got copies of that. Uh, Alicia, remind me, we're going to send this, we'll make this DVD and send some copies down to Ron so he can have them down there since they're for his church. Um, and I would say anybody else that wants, um, it'll come out in our Watchman package. That's almost again now, isn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> it'll come out in January's Watchman packets. Um, but if you'd like a copy of that to give to other people, uh, we can send that to you. Um, or you can send them the link from YouTube. It'll be on YouTube. It'll be on uh, Facebook, it will be on Sermon Audio, and starting, I think, this week, we're going to start putting everything on Parlor as well. So, opening up the channels. All of the people who got um, tired of the political editing of Twitter, they scurried over to Parlor, and Parlor's got millions of people over there now, which primarily... Those are the people that we would be speaking to anyway, is the people who left Twitter to go to Parler because they left for one reason. That is because they started censoring right wing speech in this country. So all the right wing people are the ones that would actually understand what we're saying more than anybody else would. <clears throat> so anyway, what, but God can speak to anybody. So we'll leave, we'll leave it on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. Now we're adding Parler. Uh, to that. Genesis chapter 12, um, ch uh, verse 1. This is God calling Abraham and calling him out. Uh, verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will shew thee. And I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now, who, who remembers who that's referring to? In verse 3, who is it referring to? Out of thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. There's one person in particular it's talking about. Jesus Christ. He is the one... I mean, yeah, Abraham's a good man to follow, but we're going to find out something about Abraham tonight, okay? Abraham was not sinless, was he? No. And that's the neat thing about the Bible, and that's what I like about it. The Bible doesn't have a problem telling you that all of these great people whose faith we follow we're all sinners. They all, in fact, I don't know of anybody in the Bible, uh, a person of faith that the Bible doesn't also declare their sin as well. I don't know of anybody. Um, 
the, I thought maybe at one time Joseph might be, because I don't see much about Joseph in there other than how he's a good guy. But remember what he did with the cup that he had. Put it in, he hid it, had it hidden in his brother's sack, lied about it. And it was said that it was the cup that he both drank out of and divined with. Now, I'm not exactly sure how kosher that is with God using a cup for divination. But that's the one thing that I could find about Joseph. If it was a fault, God made sure to put it in there so that we would know Joseph's not the Savior. Abraham's not the Savior. Isaac's not the Savior. The tribe of Levi isn't the Savior. David isn't the Savior. None of those. Samson isn't the Savior. Jesus Christ is the one and only Savior. Amen. Uh, so verse four. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And um, I'm not sure if I did this last week, but who can name something in the Bible since we're in Genesis 12? Something, and I'll ask all you guys, you young ones especially, name something that's in a package of 12 in the Bible, a group of 12 in the Bible. J.R. The 12 apostles. Who's next? 12 tribes. Don't let JR get all the answers. Jaden. The disciples. He only said that because he wasn't listening. Give me something else that's 12 in the Bible. Hope. Callie. Come on, don't let brother have all the glory here. All right, anybody else? Yes. Oh, you're scratching. Oh, okay. I thought you needed to be saved. Yes. <clears throat> Twelve, stones. Twelve stones where? Well, there's a couple of places. Okay. The breastplate. And what was the purpose of that breastplate? John, what was the purpose? Huh? It had the names, and I love how the King James says this. That Aaron wore the breastplate. It had 12 different, unique, precious stones in it. And the Bible says Aaron was to place it over his heart that the names of the tribes of Israel would be on his heart when he went in for the Day of Atonement sacrifice. So that he wouldn't forget his people. So does that tell you one, at least one reason why God has not forsaken Israel? Is that when Christ died, he's Aaron, the high priest. He died having the names of the 12 tribes of Israel on his heart when he did it. He died for them first and us second. Amen. What about this? You know what I'm talking about, JR? God said in Isaiah that he wouldn't forget Israel. He would never forget them. And he said, in case you're wondering, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are ever before me. And I looked at, I went... God carved Israel into his hand. And I noticed that, and he mentioned, he specifically mentioned the walls. And in New Jerusalem, there's four walls. And each wall has three gates on it. And above the gates are the names of the tribes of Israel. One, two, three, four, and each finger is divided up into three sections, just like each wall in New Jerusalem. God said, I've graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are ever before me. In other words, every time God looked at his hand, he was going to remember who he died for, who he was going to redeem. Okay. Tree of life. Tree of, the, tree, the tree of wife, the gospel according to Elmer Fudd. The tree of life has 12 manner of fruits on it for the 12 months. Think of why there are 12 months. And when you look up at night, you see a different set of stars every month. Every month, there's a different set of stars because they shift slightly from season to season. 
So here is God <clears throat> in the tabernacle and the 12 tribes around him. Okay. And he said that they would be as the stars of the sky. Okay. They would be as the stars. So the 12 tribes, the 12 months that I don't use the word Zodiac because that's not biblical. Zodiac is named after that they believe that these stars were actually their gods. Well, they are their gods, but I don't attribute. We're, I'll just say it like this. We're taking their place. They're getting kicked out. Okay, the Zodiac stars are getting kicked out. We're going to take their place. So the 12 tribes parked around in a circle with God in the midst of them represent them as the stars of the heavens. Okay, and the number 12, 12 months. Um, anything else you can think of? Yes. Huh? Oh, that's pretty interesting. 24 total. Yeah. And I never, never quite put my finger on that one yet. Yeah, I have. You're right. What I just said, those 12 constellations... Okay? They're gods and everybody worships them, especially astrologers, because they serve those gods. They serve the stars. Think of the evil sons of God. Where did the giants come from? The sons of God. Twelve fingers. Twelve toes. That's, that's my guess. Okay? If you got one better, keep it to yourself. Okay? All right, the woman who has the crown of 12 stars, she's, she's adorned with God's promise. Uh, Jerusalem, 12 gates, 12 stones. That was the other one you were referring to, 12, the 12 apostles. So right now, the New Testament being the foundation, God building the house, but it was intended to be the house of Israel, which is why the gates are named after the 12 tribes and so on. And anytime you find 12... How many days did the disciples wait before receiving the Holy Ghost? How many? No. How many of them were there? 120. And, and notice this. If 12 is a number for promise, right? Look at, look at the book of Acts. Here's this. In case you don't believe me, which you shouldn't, you should always consult the Bible. If I say a number is for something, you should say, well, I want to know what God says about it. So, Acts chapter 1, this just hit me by the way, there was 120 people, and then he, and in verse 4, being, in verse 1, being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but do what? Wait for what? The promise. What's the number 12 for? Promise. That's why there's 120 men there, 120 people there. They're waiting for the promise that God made with them. Okay. And then if you notice at the end of chapter one, since Judas is gone and he's been put out of office, they have to replace him. The number still has to be 12 to fulfill the role, the purpose of that number, the symbolism of that number. Okay. All right. So now we have uh, Abram verse four back in Genesis 12. Departed from the Lord as the Lord has spoken unto him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. I'd hate to think I had to move when I was seventy-five. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all the substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. Let's ask God's blessing. Father, we ask your blessing on your study. Tonight, Father, fill our minds with knowledge and goodness. And Father, make us fruitful for your kingdom by the seeds, Father, that you're planting in our lives and these young people's lives and these families, Lord, that gather with us every service. We pray, dear God, that you would make them fruitful for your kingdom and your glory's sake. Everything, Father, that we do, everything that this church does, we do it for your sake. The people that we feed, the people that we witness to, the people that we minister to, the pastors that we bless. Father, they're yours. 
They're not ours. I don't own them. Father, they're your kingdom. And we gladly serve your kingdom, Father. No matter how hard it gets, remind us, dear God, that we're serving you. And it's a joy and an honor to serve you. Even if the work gets hard, we'll do it. And we'll do it until the day we die. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now, uh, go to Hebrews chapter 11. <clears throat> this thing about being called out. Uh, in fact, on your way over there, I want you to stop in the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth. Ezra, Nehemiah, let's see, just before that. First, second Kings, first, second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job. Where is Ruth? It's back before first Samuel, isn't it? I knew I'd find it eventually. I just had this thought. This idea of coming out or being called out or being separated out. We know a little bit of the story of Ruth. Uh, we know it takes place, the, the main story takes place in Bethlehem, Judah, which is Bethlehem of Judea. And we have the man Elimelech. And I want you to notice in verse 2, the name of the man was Elimelech and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the name of his two sons, Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem. They were, so they're a lineage of David. They came into the, um, or the, Lineage of Judah, they're going to be the lineage of, Jade, of, of David. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. They left Bethlehem, had to go into Moab because of a famine. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died and she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah and the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. Ten always represents the law, it represents the commandments. And notice what happens in the ten years. And this, remember the story of Ruth, what it has to do with. If the man dies, no one, the woman cannot receive the inheritance. The wife cannot have that inheritance, have the man's property. That's just the way God did it, did it for a reason. But the, if the man died... Then it was left up to his sons. The inheritance went to them. If the man either left no sons or the sons died, then one of the man's brothers has to take one of those women to be wife to raise up seed of the original man. In, the, in this case, it was Elimelech. So now that Elimelech has died and the number 10 represents the law and the number 10 is always going to tell you in stories like this, the law cannot do it. Keeping the commandments and trying to be good does not save anybody. It's insufficient. So when that when I see that 10 there, it makes sense. Verse five, Malon and Chilion died also, both of them, and the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. So here we have Orpah and Ruth. And they have no husband. Naomi has no husband. They're going to lose their inheritance. They're going to lose everything, <clears throat> excuse me, that Elimelech had. And verse 6, she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. And wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, go return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kind with the, kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. And the Lord grant you that you may find rest each of you in the house of her husband. She, then she kissed them. They lifted up their voice and wept. They loved her, this woman. They loved their mother-in-law. Uh, and they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons of my womb that you may be, that they may be your husbands? In other words, I'm not going to have any more. Turn again, my daughters. Go your way, for I'm too old to have an husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have an husband also tonight and should also bear sons, would you tarry with them till they were, would you wait another 20 years for them to grow up? By then you'll be old. 
Would you stay with them from, from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. They lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. Let me tell you, Ruth is a type of the church, the Gentiles. The people who will never turn their back on Israel. Never. I won't. I, God has convinced me in multiple ways that he still is intending to keep his promise to his literal sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I believe him. Amen. And so we're Ruth. And uh, verse 15, she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back under her people and under her gods. Return thou. This is it. Right? She mentioned her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or, or to return from following after thee. And, and I like this. For whither thou goest, I will go. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people and thy God, my God. Amen. And the, here's the point I'm making about this. She says in verse 17, where thou diest, will I die and there will I be buried and the Lord do so to me and more also if aught but death part thee and me. And when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. And so they two went until they came to Bethlehem. It came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And they said, is this Naomi? And she said unto them, call me not Naomi, call me Mara for the which means bitter. Remember the waters of Mirabah? They were bitter. The word Mirabah and Mara are related. Mara means bitterness. And um, so they called me Mara for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against thee and the Almighty hath afflicted me? And Naomi returned and Ruth Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, which returned out of the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of the bar of the harlots. Now, I'm not going to read to you the rest of the whole book of Ruth, but you know the story here. Who does God use to bring back the inheritance? Ruth. But what did Ruth have to do? Leave the land of her nativity. She had to come out. Of the camp of her own people. Years ago. And, and, I, and I'll tell you. God had moved in the men of this church. To make it so easy for me to do this. Especially Brother Sterling. When I began to see. A, after I came out of my years of rebellion. And wanting to be a Rick Warren preacher. And God whipped that out of me. I came back to the Bible, came back to doing things right, doing things the way I had learned. Preaching the way I had been preached to. And I thought that the denomination would be glad that I did. Until I mentioned two words. King James. And I found out very quickly that those two words will close every door you hope to walk through in the denomination. And it, it took me by surprise because I could have swore some of the preachers that I looked up to and the denominational leaders, they were already there. I was the one that had strayed and came back. And they would be glad I came back. And one after one after another railed on me to my face. And I would <clears throat> talk to the board and say, you know, we got a quarterly meeting coming up and it's going to be here. I don't know who they've got because they had somebody different. Every, every three months we'd have a meeting, a district denominational meeting. And one of the other pastors, they just went on a, I guess, everybody took turns preaching the meeting. And I said, what are we going to do if the next meeting they have here at Bethel, 
they call a guy who uses the NIV and he preaches here. And they said, well, we're not going to have that. And I said, I'm not going to let him do it. So God used those men. Brother Sterling would always say, what good does the denomination do us anyway? All they do is beg us for money. Do we get anything out of it? No. And I went, you're right. So we left. And up until those years, I had put all my hope in the denomination that I would climb the ladder and be noticed. I'm just telling you how I was back then. I guess every young man wants to be noticed by his peers and, oh, he's up and coming. He's the guy, you know. And God used some of the men that I looked up to the most to literally hurt my feelings. They hurt my feelings. And I got immediately bitter at them. And God knew what he was doing. He was calling me out of, the, of he was calling me out of Moab. He was calling me out of the land of my nativity, the camp that I was in. He was calling me out of that. Not too long after that, we went to, drove all the way to Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, took a bunch of people in the church to a preacher's conservative preaching conference out there. I mean, preachers that knew how to preach. Drove all the way out there. I set up a table of my stuff. You know, I was trying to make contacts with some preachers, maybe do some meetings. The first guy that got up and preached, he ripped the King James apart. And anybody that believed it. And I, my wife will tell you, I grabbed my Bible and she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm leaving. I didn't drive ten and a half hours to come and listen to this. I'm, I told her, I said, I'm leaving. I'm mad. I'm leaving. She said, sit down, calm down. I said, no, I'm leaving. I'm not going to listen to this. Well, she, she called me down. And right after that, David Gibbs, Christian Law Association, who loves the King James, got right behind that guy. They had scheduled him to preach and they had a warm up preacher before him. And David just went to town on it, man. You know what he preached? He preached about reading the Bible and about how a guy made him feel guilty. He, a guy, he was at the store and a guy in front of him, they got to talking and David told him he was a Christian. The guy said, I'm a Christian too. And he's talking about reading the Bible. And the guy said, yeah, David, David Gibbs said, I try to read the Bible through once a year. And the guy said, yeah. He said, I read it every two months straight through. Do what? See, yeah, I read the Bible every, from Genesis to Revelation, every two months. I read the whole Bible again. I start all over again, read it again. And David started scratching his head and going, it ain't possible to read the Bible in two months. He found out, he said, I found out I, he was right and I was wrong. And I'm going, Whoa. anyway, it was a good message. Uh, Hebrews 11, now that I've tarried. The point of all this, God has to call you out. You will find, and I, I would assume this would be true for everybody, not just me. But somehow, some way in life, if God calls you to something, he is going to call you out of something else. And I'll, it may be different from you. Maybe you weren't in a denomination or maybe your life wasn't my life. But I guarantee you, Abraham is a picture of that. Ruth is a picture of that. Everybody in the Bible is a picture of that. Joseph was a picture of that. If God called him to something, he called him out of something else. Hebrews 11. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should re after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country. Dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob. The heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations whose builder and maker is God. God called him out of his nativity, the land of his birth the place of his kinfolk, the place where he might have been comfortable, the place that he loved, he grew up and called him out and said, but you don't understand what I'm calling you out from, even though you might like it. Trust me, 
I have a place that you'll like a lot better. Amen. Hebrews 11 now. Verse 14. <clears throat> For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Consider the Apostle Paul. Not only did he leave his religion, the way I look at it, he left it twice. Because he's called out on the road to Damascus. He's a zealot for the law. He's a zealot for his people. He loves his people. God calls him out, saves him. And where does Paul then begin preaching his ministry? In the synagogues. I mean, he called him out of thinking he was saved by being a Jew. He no longer thinks that way anymore. But at the beginning, he's still going to the synagogues. He's preaching in the synagogues. He's talking to the Jews. He's trying to work with the Jews. And after a while, God calls him out again the second time. And what God did, God did with Paul, the same thing he did with me. That country, that nativity, that denomination that I loved so much that I wanted to serve, I wanted to give my work, my labor, I wanted to, I, I wanted to be part of it because at one time I believed in what they were doing. But God allowed me the way he did Paul, Paul got to where he couldn't stand preaching to Jews anymore because all they did was argue with him. All they did was get mad. All he could see in their faces was the anger and the hatred that they had for him and the gospel he was preaching. And Paul finally said, I'm done. I'm getting nowhere with these people. And if I'm going to preach and spend my time preaching, I'd rather do it with people who will actually listen as opposed to people who don't care. I know that feeling sometimes. He left. And he said, I'll never again go. If I go to a city, I'm not going to go to the Jews. Now, if one came by and wanted to hear him, he'd save them. He'd preach the gospel to them. And I'm sure every now and then some of the Jews believed. But he said, I'm not, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going to go. So where do you go after that? Mars Hill. Mars Hill's not a Jewish worship place. What was it? It's where they had all these... False gods and statues and where all the Greeks got together to debate this and hear this philosopher. And Paul said, see that unknown God over there? I know who he is. And he goes and he finds fertile ground where the Gentiles are. And he left the land of his birth twice. God called him out. God will call you out too. Second Corinthians chapter 6, turn there. I don't care if it's family country you see i i've seen most of this country i've traveled it i've seen the rocky mountains i've seen the northwest pacific forest and the mountains there I've seen the grand canyon I've seen niagara falls both sides canadian canadian and american side I've seen New York City, I've seen the Plains, I've seen the Appalachians, I've seen the South, the North. I like Missouri because it's like a combination of all of them. I've seen the desert. I love this country. But if God calls me to a better one, I'll go. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. What agreement at the temple of God with idols? We know who the temple of God is. Ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And there's things that just don't match up with Bible Christianity that could be in somebody's life. They just don't quite go together. And 
at some point, God always knows what he's doing. He always knows when to do things. He always knows how to do things. At some point, what God sees in you that may not be right, God will call you out of it. God waited till Abram was 75 years old before he ever talked to him. 75 years of life. God never says a word. Now, all of a sudden, 75, God's calling him to move and go someplace else. But Abram did it. He had never seen the land, but he trusted God. One of the hardest things that we find to do is trusting God when it comes to the unknown. We trust him for the things that we know. But when God says something new to us and we have a hard time trusting him, but that's really the test of faith is to listen to God when you don't know rather than when you think you do know. And he said, if you'll come out of that, he says, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them. And be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So maybe you're in the midst of a bunch of unclean things. God will call you out. Maybe you're with family or people. And you don't, you like them. But you don't know how to come out of them. God will show you how. Maybe I know people that have left their country and gone to other places. Gary, you was telling me, Gary's got, what was it, your uncle? That 32? He was about 32 years old, something like that, left here and went to the Congo. Now the Congo, if you look on Google Earth, it's the jungle. It's where Tarzan lives. God called his uncle out to leave the land of his birth and go and preach the gospel there. And he died there. He's still buried there. He showed me a picture of his plaque there. If God calls you. God calls you. Amen. He says, come out from among them. And he said, verse 18, I will be a father unto you and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord almighty. Uh, Revelation 18, I'll be done. Last place. Because here's what God's going to do to the land of your nativity if you don't leave. Did Lot leave? Yep. What did God do to Sodom? Revelation 18, 1. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. That you be not partakers of her sins, that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven. Melissa, you were telling us about a Ritz crackers commercial where they just had to show two guys putting on lipstick and then holding hands going to a Christmas family function. What's that got to do with crackers for crying out loud? Well, here's what it was about. They were either forced or they were paid greatly to promote Babylon. Ask yourself the question, who funds the TV shows you watch? Where do they get their money from? Who funds the movies? And let me tell you something. We're finding out this year that Disney is not a friend of America. Who owns Disney? What, what communist party owns Disney? China. China's making movies specifically for the American market. 
to promote certain ideas, certain things. Movies that are pro-communist, they're very subtle, but they're there. At some point, so that you will not be a partaker of Babylon's judgment, you should think about coming out of Babylon altogether. Amen. And I've said this, and I'm prepared to do it. I like my technology. It's how I work. But there's a limit. And I'll know that limit when it gets here. And then we'll have to stop and say no more. I'm not doing it. I'm not going any farther than this. Guys used to preach without a tablet years ago. Amen. Let's go to prayer. Father, we ask for your grace and your mercy. And I thank you, God, for calling us out where we used to be, who we used to be with, the things we used to love, the things we used to do, the people that we used to try to gain favor with. Father, you called us out for a reason. You can't use us there. That's not where we're supposed to be. You called us to a better place, although we may not have seen it then. And God, I knew I didn't see it then. But I see it now. And I'm very thankful you did. There's been other camps, God, that you've pulled me out of. I don't understand why. But I trust you. And I ask you, God, Lord, to help me to find that new country you want me in. That new place. That place in ministry, God, that you'll satisfy me. You'll bless me. Father, bless each one of these people. Show them the way out. Lead them gently out. Call them out. Tie their hearts to you, God, so that they just really don't see a choice. They're just going to go wherever you go and lead wherever you lead. Because after all, you're taking us out of the house of bondage. And you're putting us in the land of liberty. Thank you for that, Father. Each one that hears me tonight. May they find that new land that you promised them. Bless your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.